So, I, I, but I want to get right to our panel because tonight is about navigating the music business in LA and um, we have three people that will bring very unique perspectives, perspective on that issue and on uh, career advice for you. Many of you have, have told me that this is where you want to end up and um, this is where they've ended up and at various stages of their career they are all exceedingly accomplished, exceedingly articulate uh, ladies. So uh, first I want to introduce you to Jody Gerson who is the co-president of uh, Sony ATV Music Publishing. Billboard Magazine has named her the second most powerful woman in the music business two years in a row now. Uh, so you know that she's killing it. And she, has, and she has mentored a number of our students and others and really has brought not only her artist clients along, but, but people who work in the business. And, I, and it, she's made it her business to be really, really supportive of SU. And so she is an adopted orange woman. Uh, <laughs> Kelly DiStefano uh, was before Bandier program, uh, but a management and accounting major in music industry minor and uh, like the stalwart uh, leader of our student record label and and and, uh, and she has an amazing career story to tell you. Olivia Zero, as you know, graduated two years ago from the Bandier program and has had a remarkable career including having been mentored by Jody and having uh, really mastered, I think, this navigating Los Angeles music business piece. So please welcome our three wonderful guests. And, and uh, I'd like to ask each of you to start the evening by talking about your career arc from as early as you can say, that's when I knew I wanted to be in the music business. And I would like Jody to start that. Oh, because mine was so long ago. Um, <laughs> wait, long ago. <laughs> Um, I always knew I wanted to be in the music business. I loved music. Um, I went to college at Northwestern, and um, even when I was in high school, I always had internships at radio stations and television stations, and I, I, I was always super ambitious. I was in a hurry to get a career going. Um, I don't think I ever swayed from that. It wasn't like, you know, I, I look back on it and think, mm, I should have gone to Europe for a year. I should have done all those things that I didn't do because I was in a hurry. But I think being in a hurry and being ambitious got me where I am today. And I don't have any regrets about it because I get to wake up every morning and love going to work. Um, for me, you know, it was that I loved music. I understood it. I had a sense of what could be popular. Um, and I didn't want to have to wake up really early and go to work. So <laughs> it fit my requirement of being able to come to work at 10 o'clock. I mean, I'm there by 8.30 every morning now before everyone else, but everyone else is there by 10. <laughs> 9.30 maybe in LA. New York, it's 10. I swear that was one of the things that made how me want to be in the How did you know that you knew a hit? Just, how did I you just had a really good sense of it. You know, I, it's funny, on my way here, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who has a son at USC in their music program. And he wants to be a songwriter. He's a great musician. And he's completely uninspired because he's studying all the time. He's studying songwriting. He's studying you know, guitar. He's studying voice, which doesn't give him a chance to live. And you know, we were talking about, like, can you learn how to do this? I think on the artist side, you are it. You either are it or you're not it. I think in terms of being an executive in the business, there are things you could learn, but what you really need, you have, an, have to have like an innate confidence that you know it's good. I could be wrong, but I wouldn't get to sign the artists I've been able to sign, and some I was wrong on, but I had conviction about them. So I don't know, I just had a sense of it, and fortunately, a lot of times I was right. Yeah. Would you mention a <laughs> Sometimes I, I, I was wrong. They, I've had some losers. The students, at least, have seen your bio, but mm -hmm. um, some of the other folks here might not know who you've signed over the last few years. Um, well, my first biggest sign, I mean, one that you guys would know, my, my biggest one for a long time was Alicia Keys, who I had the great fortune of meeting when she was 14 years old and just 
I tell every, you know, anybody who asked me, how did you know? There was just, I just knew. That being said, um, my boss, who was my boss then and my boss now, Marty Mandir, who you guys all know his name, would say to me, oh, that girl that you signed, she may just be really talented, but mm, it's how you paid her all that money and it's been years now. And it was years before she actually came out with a record. And I just, you know, I mean, it was just one of those things, I knew that. Um, so I signed Alicia, I signed Lady Gaga. Um, more recently, I signed Pitbull, who I work really closely with. I signed Joy Williams from the Civil Wars, who I really just have a great passion for. Whether or not this album will be successful or not, I don't care, I just, I just love her. Um, I don't know, I work with Shakira Enrique Iglesias, um, work with Odd Future, just signed a guy named Vic Mensa, who I'm crazy for, Mike Posner, I mean, there are a few, and you know, I oversee a staff who also have great years and have had great signings, so. Part of it is the staff, part of, but, but. Big part is the but staff. Because I can't but you be pick the staff. Yeah, I'm really good at picking people. Yeah. I have a great, <laughs> I have, an amazing staff of people who work with me. And, yeah. okay. you know, it, it's like you guys are talking about navigating, if I could just get to where we're going, navigating the LA music scene. You know, there were two years that I would get notes from Olivia Zaro. I'd like to intern this year for so-and-so, and I'd like to intern for so-and-so. And every year I would get a note from her. And I would help her get an internship, but I didn't meet her. And then right in your senior year, Mm -hmm. I got the note. You know, I'd like to work for you this year. I was like, mm hmm, okay. So this girl that I've like gotten these other gigs for. Foisted her on everybody else. Well, well let me never see. In LA. Okay, fine. But let's see <laughs> how she's going to do for me. And the thing is, she really is a great example of what you're supposed to do. You know, Olivia came out to LA. There was no drama about where she was going to live and what she was going to do and questions. Of it. She came in. There was no task that was too big, too small for her. She became friends with everyone in the office. She added real value. She wasn't afraid to talk to me. It wasn't like, you know, sometimes interns come in and, you know, they're like standing outside your office and it's like, are you kidding me? Like, I don't want to see that person. Honestly, like you want to be as nice as possible, but the truth is the people that I will always identify are people of confidence and that they could bring something to the table that perhaps I can't. You know, people who work for me have all different kinds of tastes that I wouldn't have, but what makes me sign off on a deal for them is their conviction. And I cite Olivia because, you know, when she finished working for me and she graduated and she was looking for a job, I would have helped her do anything. And it was so easy for me to give her recommendations, because I knew what she could do. So that's, is that kind of where we're going? Can you like boil that this answer? down to have confidence, bring value, and no <laughs> task too small? Um, partly, okay. but also, but here's the other thing. In what I do, I'm a music publisher. It's about, you know, I have interns who come in and say, oh, this band is really good. This guy's really good. Here's 20 people you should sign. You know what, there aren't 20 people that I should sign. Of those 20 people that you've identified, which one's gonna happen? Because that's the one I want. I don't wanna have to do the work. I don't wanna have to go through tw you know, three songs of 20 people, and me, I don't wanna pick it. You have to pick it. So it's like, it's you know, when I was coming up, you had to see a live show. You would t I used to listen. I mean, this is how dated it is. I have said this so many times because it just sometimes feel like, oh my God, I've done this forever. But for me, when I first came into the business, you would listen to an album and you would say, oh, how many hits are there from this album? What could I do if the record company didn't break a song from this, this album? What could I do as a music publisher? Could I place a song in a film? Could I give it to somebody else? Um, and today, and you had to really trust that the record company was gonna break it. Well, today, you guys should know what's gonna be a hit before I know, because, you, because if it, things are happening so organically. A record company can no longer say, we've identified an artist, we're gonna make them the biggest star in the world. 
Because the truth is, if you don't buy it, it doesn't matter how much money a record company is going to spend. Should I keep going with this? It's like I was looking at a band called The Weeknd. And I spent a lot of time. Do you guys all know who The Weeknd are? OK. So I spent a lot of time with Abel from The Weeknd. And people kept saying to me, oh my god, you know, this trilogy sold, you know, 400,000 on iTunes and this new album is really dope and he's selling out tours all over the world. And I listened to the album and I'm like, ugh, you know, I don't hear a hit. Well, for me, he could be the greatest artist in the world, but for me as a music publisher, the only way I make money, my company makes money, is from record sales, licenses for sync if, if song, with songs. And I passed on it. And I, pa I didn't make the, it was such an outrageous amount of money. And sometimes you have to kind of go, okay, I'm a fan, but business-wise it doesn't make sense. And when they, their first week, they, it's, you know, they sold 90, whatever it was, and the second week it dropped, I was like, phew. And if I had done it, I would have gone against my gut because it didn't matter what everybody else was telling me. I knew it wasn't going to sell. Now, it doesn't mean that I won't go to the shows. It doesn't mean that he won't sell out everywhere. But I feel like my conviction said it doesn't matter how popular they are. If they don't have a hit song, it's not right for me. You know? So, um, you know, there's some that you have to pass on that you go, okay, I'm going to be a fan of yours. And... But from a business point of view, it doesn't make sense. Um, so unlike Jody, I didn't actually know that I wanted to work in music um, really until I was at college because I grew up in a small town and it really never dawned on me that it was really even a possibility. Um, it just seemed sort of like another other world in big cities. Um, so when I started looking at schools, I did decide that I'd at least pick one that had a music business program on the off chance that I wanted to look into that. Um, so that's sort of why, one of the reasons why I ended up at Syracuse. Um, one of my majors was accounting as well as TRF and then I minored in music business. Um, but when graduation time came and actually way in advance of that, being an accounting major, you start to get job offers in the fall of your senior year. And I started to get job offers in accounting and I'm like, hmm, what should I do? They're offering me real money to go move to New York City after I graduate. How can I say no to this and take the chance after I graduate to just get a job in the music business? So I kind of debated it for a while and decided to just get myself to New York. And for the first year and a half I was in New York, I worked for an accounting firm. And then I made the choice one day that this, this was it. Why am I doing this? I want to work in the music business. So I basically quit my job cold turkey. I didn't have anything lined up, but it was the only way I was going to be able to start meeting with people and actually find something else. And they were shocked. The company was shocked when I quit. They're like, is there anything we can do to keep you around? Can we offer you more money? What can we do to help you? I'm like, no, there's nothing. Where are you going? Nowhere, I don't have anything. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was what it was. So I was living in New York and I, I really didn't want to intern, you know, being out of college for a year and a half, it's not the ideal situation, but I also realized that that's the best way to get your foot in the door and to meet people um, so that they'll actually hire you. So I started to look at um, various internship opportunities as well as job opportunities, and I ended up deciding to intern at the agency group in New York. Um, and I lucked out beyond all luckiness. I showed up for my first day, expecting, you know, great, it's my first day of the intern, they'll show me around. And basically the first thing they told me was, well, we just had an assistant quit yesterday. Our other intern's moving away. So we're gonna have you interview with two agents. So I interviewed with Seth Rappaport, who some of you may have seen speak, because I know that he does that a lot, also an SU grad, and one other agent there. Um, they were gonna sh needed a shared assistant. So they called up Rezik, said, Seth called Rezik, said, hey, this Ke Kelly girl, is she all right? He gave me the seal of approval. So they hired me that day, um, and I had a job. It was pretty amazing. So I didn't have to intern. But I would still suggest if, if you're in that situation, it would still be worth it, because if well, I had still- You interned for two hours. Yeah, I had two hours. <laughs> if I had hung around, 
they would have, it still would have been the next assistant position that would have opened up. It could have been two months, it could have been six months. They'll never have anybody be my record. Um, so I worked with them and, and that really helped in that case, having that Syracuse connection because I was able to utilize that so that they didn't actually go and look at other people. They just got a call in, said she's okay, done deal. Um, I worked at the agency group for about two years as an assistant. Uh, eventually I just moved over and was only Seth's assistant. I was getting to the point where it was kind of, I didn't need to decide, do I want to be an agent or do I not? The agency group is really great because they let, allow assistants to do a lot. You get to review the contracts. At a certain point, they'll let assistants start signing their own bands. I was at the point where I really needed to move over. If I was going to be an agent, it was my time to start signing bands and really make the next step. I decided I didn't want to be an agent. I started looking elsewhere, and for personal reasons, I was looking mostly in LA. Um, and I kind of decided I wanted to work for AG Live. I don't really know why. I decided it was a big company. There were a lot of opportunities. I wanted to be in touring and concert promotions. And I made that my mission. I asked everybody I know, do you know anybody that works there? I had some of my own connections in New York, but I hadn't really told anyone I was working with that I was thinking about leaving. So some of them were good friends, and I just didn't really want it to get out that I was ready to leave yet. It took me quite a while um, to get in the door at AEG. They're not the quickest um, company to hire people. I think it took me probably six to eight months from the first time that I tried to reach out. So I tried a few different connections to get in, and finally the right person got my resume in the right hands. And even after that, uh, I think I made up an excuse. I said, oh yeah, I'm gonna be in LA this weekend. How about I just stop by? And so I booked a flight and came out to LA for the weekend and happened to be here and went and met with them. Because otherwise, they just weren't moving forward and weren't going to be like, OK, we're ready now. So at least that got me trying to you know, move across country in their face and present. Uh, I kept calling them. I was very persistent. Probably every two weeks, I'd at least call, hey, you guys, what are you doing? Are you making a decision yet? And finally, they were like, all right, we're ready. And they, they had me fly out. They met with me on the spot. I was shocked after all this time. They're like, all right, great, you're hired. I'm like, all right, I guess I'm moving to LA, LA in two weeks. Um, and I've actually been there for the past, it's just over six years. I started out as uh, the assistant to Paul Gongware, who's one of the CEOs of Concerts West, which is one of the major touring divisions there. As well, That was half my job, and then the other half was working uh, within the touring division on actual tour-related stuff, not a executive assistant related. Because I really didn't want to be somebody's executive assistant but I was willing to take the position because it was half and half, so I knew it would get me to where I wanted to be. Um, so gradually, they basically, they gave me more and more responsibilities as I proved myself, and they were able to trust me. And now I've uh, kind of made a position for myself. This position actually didn't exist when uh, I started, and it's the director of business development for Concerts West. It was a hole they always kind of needed, but there was nobody there, and as I just started doing the stuff that was needed, the position kind of just got created because I was there doing the stuff that needed to be done. Um, and that's, I guess, where I've been. You've also been on, on the road a lot. Uh, yeah, especially this year. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a road person by nature. We have guys that do that full time. Um, but this year I did go out and uh, I was the promoter rep for our Rolling Stones tour, which was quite an experience. Um, definitely glad I did that. And, I was out covering some Bon Jovi Stadium dates. I usually go out maybe once or twice a year just for like little bits and pieces. I kind of, they tease me in the office because I always go out on the, uh, the real big tours, the ones where I don't have to ride a bus, where I get to just fly between dates <laughs> and have really good food and, you know. Part of this really, though, your accounting skills came back into play. That's true. Um, one, one of the reasons when I met with AAG that they were happy to hire me is because they saw that I had an accounting background. And I'm not an accountant. I don't work in the accounting department. But it's very important when we're making tour deals, the finance and the accounting side of it. And it's really important that um, we have people that understand that. So when I go on the Rolling Stones, I'm the promoter up and I settle the shows. I do a you know, work with ticketing, opening up seats, a number of things, but having that accounting background and being able to understand how the finances work and how a tour deal works. 
and how maybe we can structure something differently has really gone a long way. So I may not be just in a normal, you know, accounting back office job, but having that background and being able to understand that has, has helped me immensely. You also did McCartney and a major EDM artist, I forgot. Uh, we did Avicii last Avicii. year in arenas, yeah. which was uh, an interesting mm -hmm. experience. We, we, yeah, it was interesting. We took, we, we went to sort of, we wanted to do it right, and we wanted to protect the fans and everybody that was going. So we really did a lot of advance work um, Production-wise, you know, can people get onto the floor? Can people, you know, we had a, uh, a medical room set up where people could go and just sit and have a moment if maybe they had drank too much or taken some sort of medication or anything. So we were trying to do our, <laughs> our best as a promoter knowing what the situation was because arenas, I mean, they can't, they can't handle that bad rap that maybe a smaller club or something can. So for, for them to allow us to even come in and bring the show in, there were a lot of things that they, I mean, we did on our own, but I think they trusted us because they've worked with us in other capacities. Well, I started working or got a taste of the music industry my junior year of high school. I worked at Atlantic Records in their PR department um, for Sheila Richmond. I don't know. Um, and after that, I was sort of hooked, and I knew that I either wanted to be in the music business or I wanted to do music myself. Um, my dad is pretty strict, and he said, if you're going to go to college, you can do music, but you have to learn the business side of the industry. So that was really helpful, and that's how I ended up in the Bandier program. Um, I did an internship every summer that I was there and I um, like Jody was really ambitious and I didn't love college I wanted to start working so I went abroad three semesters my senior year I did LA and New York and I interned for Jody um, in LA and Marty in New York because um, I knew that I wanted to be working I actually found that to be really helpful um, because it was sort of like half being in college and half being in the real world and it gave me a really easy transition into my job which I started the day after graduation. Um, I gotta stop you for okay. a second because Robin and I today were talking about just that piece that these away semesters are really your first job. It's, it, it's a work environment, you're in a, a sizzling music hotbed and are you're you're auditioning yourself you know? yeah. yeah yeah it definitely felt like yeah. like work and yeah. if you make it worth your time which I felt I really did um, it's definitely worth it and I would highly recommend doing it your senior year I know a lot of people like to be on campus but if you're serious about it I would I would be out here your senior year um, what else? Now I work at uh, in management at Scooter Braun Projects. Well, wait a minute. Something happened in between there. You, you had a few offers, as I recall. Yeah. Um, so Katie Welly, who works with Jody, recommended me to Ron Lafitte. Um, he was my first job offer. Then I got offered a job at Sony ATV in New York. Um, and I got offered a job. Where else? Keith Naftali at RCA. With Keith Naftali at RCA. Thanks to Jody. He's amazing. Um, and then finally with Scooter. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I had done publishing. I worked at a studio. Um, I worked at Interscope Management. But I knew that graduating, I wanted to work for the person I could learn the most from. And that person from my offers seemed to be Scooter. Um, I wanted to work at a small company. And his company from where I stood seemed to be small with a really big impact. So that was important to me. Um, and so I did it, and here I am. <laughs> and you're, so you're executive assistant to Scooter, mm -hmm. and um, the company actually has grown since you've been there. Yeah. yeah. Anki, who's here, she is our newest hire. She works yeah. with us. Um, I, yeah. When I first got there, I think there were six to eight people. There are now 20, and that's in the last, like, 18 months. We also started a film and TV division, tech division. We have, we have some have outside. Label. We have some outside projects. Can we talk about that? What? Your sister? sister? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. 
Oh, so in like the last couple of weeks, months, I started managing my little sister, who's a singer-songwriter. Um, that's been really exciting, and that sort of helped me transition from being an executive assistant to where I would like to be a few months from now. So it's looking good that a few months from now I'll be doing A&R for Scooter and also uh, songwriter and producer relations, helping manage our roster of writers and producers and doing a little bit of publishing. So that worked out. Uh, now, <laughs> would, would you upstream Victoria to, the, to SB? Or do you want to carve that out for yourself? I'd like to carve that out for myself. So listen, you got a lot of music freaks here. Aren't you going to plug her? Yeah, you guys should all go listen to her. <laughs> her name Ryan. is Victoria Ryan with right. two N's. She's adorable and really talented. She's 17. She was just on the Today Show last week, which was really exciting. How did that um, come about? She was performing at a party, and Hoda crashed the party. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was like, who's that singing? And it was my sister. And she asked her to come on the show. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Serendipity. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, OK, so um, we actually have used up half our time just thinking about uh, how each of you came to this place you're in now. Uh, and each story is instructive, particularly because LA is a piece of it. Um, Jody picked up a few things about confidence and bringing value to companies, and and uh, I I wonder if if the rest if, if either of you guys can think of anything else that you would say to some people that are really experiencing that senior stress. I think there's a number of those in the room. I think there's some members of the class of 2013 in the room that are still out here pounding the pavement. Um, what advice do you have for them? How do we I, I would say one thing is that you just have to be willing to do anything, whether you're paid, whether you're not paid. It's, it's all about getting your, yourself in front of people. It also helps, even if you don't know what you want to do, if you pretend like you do, because it makes it a lot easier for people to find a place for you if you, if you know what they do. And you're, well, I would be really interested in doing this. Oh, well, I can direct you to this person, especially if you're networking. I know I've had people come to me looking for jobs or, oh, here's my resume, I'm open to anything. And I'm like, all right, well, I know quite a few places, especially in a big company, I, I'm not gonna send it to everyone, but if you have you know, one or two areas that you're specifically interested in, when you're networking, that especially helps. Right? I know you wanna also, you can always add the caveat, I'm open to anything but that helps to narrow it down to take advantage of that. Um, I would also suggest persistence. I know that's helped me multiple times, just not giving up, nagging people. So how did you know the balance? You called every two weeks, you said. It was, I think it was about every two weeks. And I actually was literally at the point where I, was, I had pretty much given up. I was not gonna call anymore. And w one of the reasons I moved here was, was personal, but my boyfriend lived here, and I wasn't moving here until I had a job because just personally, that wasn't a decision I wanted to make. And he was like, just, just call them, just call them one more time, come on, just do it. It's like, but I'm annoying them. It's been, it's been three months since I was here last and actually saw them face to face. I'm like, can't they make a decision? I, don't, I just don't understand. If they wanted to hire me, they would have talked to me. And so I somehow, that last call I made, did it, and then it just kept it rolling. Because they weren't telling me no, they right. just weren't, saying yes either you have to but you if they said no then well then i would have respected you, that you would have gone yeah a different direction but but also but you know i i like what you're saying there are a couple of things one just because you want the job doesn't mean that there isn't a, like like i feel like first of all number one make friends with people's assistants be really oh, nice to mm -hmm. the assistants mm -hmm. because the truth is like i could have a job opening um I'm just not focused on it. I have other fires to put out. I have other issues. And the time in which I'm ready to focus on it, my assistant will say to me, you know what? This person called like several times. It was so nice on the phone and blah, 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 blah. It's going to make me think about it. The other thing is key, meet as many people. And I also like what you said about knowing what you want to do. Because anybody who comes to my office and says, they, they get this time with me. You have to understand from where we sit, we're busy. We're really busy. 
And to take the time as a favor to someone or because someone's been persistent, you gotta like make best use of that time. So people come into my office and go, I don't really know what I want to do. It's like, really, I have to work for you? <laughs> yeah. And that's what it yeah. feels like from this side. Like, you have to put yourself in the position of the person you're talking to. How much time and energy does that person want to put into you? If you came in and said, this is exactly what I, what I want to do, and I've looked at all of these job sites, and there's a job at Sony Music in, you know, the motion picture division in music. I could go, oh, okay, I know that person, I'll make a phone call for you. It, you as specific as you, I think you're mm -hmm. absolutely right in everything you said, I would just add the assistant part. And I think the assistant part is great. I also think what you said about confidence previously kind of feeds into knowing what you want to do. You may not know that there's going to be a song plugger job in your company or somebody else's company coming up, but you may know that you have a good way of articulating what yeah. what might appeal to a filmmaker or to right. a television commercial maker or yeah. whatever it is, and, and and that might be something to explain to a person that's ready to help, right? right. So in other words, even if you don't know specifically of a job title that you know you're going for at that very moment, maybe you're packaging yourself in such a way as to say, here's what I'm good at. Yeah, I mean, there are yeah. people who come to see me and I don't have something, but they stay with me. They, you know, when I say confident, it's not cocky. It's confident and humble. Thank you. Cocky is not good, guys. <laughs> I don't want anybody, you know, like pounding their chest in my office thinking that they're too good to do things, that they, they know they're, like you, there is a balance. And I can't say that I can describe it, but I know it when I see it. And again, like the thing about Olivia was that she was confident but she wasn't, she was never obnoxious. She would do anything. She was nice to everybody in the office. Remember also in these office situations, you're not necessarily with people who all went to like good universities. And so there's like, you have to, you really have to understand your audience. Who, who's in the workplace? Who's, what is everybody like? You know, and I think also being a woman is another thing. Like, how do you play it, you know? Like easy to get in an office and then what are you gonna do? You know, and, and so those are things I think about when, when people come into my office. What, how are they gonna be in the outside world? But you do, you do stick with the people. Like there's a couple people who have come to see me and I didn't have anything. But when other jobs came up, or they make it easy. Hey, Jody, I hear there's this amazing that. job. I, I can, is there anyone you know? You did that? This, I yeah, said, hey, easy. Jody. Oh, okay. She's like, hey, I Jody, do you, I want to work for Scooter Braun. <laughs> I said, really? Do you? Is that really <laughs> the job that you want? Sure. All of, but we talked through, yeah. you know, all of your opportunities. And, and the truth and is. And I think you even said, I don't think you should. I but said, if I you don't want think you it, should, I'll but support I, it. I did. I absolutely did. I thought that other jobs were safer. And I think, I, I think it was the right job for you in that you did for what you just said. You got more experience in that job as, and than you would have in any of those other mm -hmm. jobs. And I also, and I may have said, I like Keith Napoli, but I think it's really hard for a woman to start in the music business as in an assistant in an A&R department. You did say that. I think it's a dead end. Mm -hmm. I do, I think it's a dead end yeah. job. I think because those guys are protecting their position, really tough to make up. Just they're my opinion on assistants tough, in a &R Tough position. to move past them. Yeah, and I find it in my own office, like when, when assistants bring, like I always think that everybody is where I am at. Like I'm so happy to see other executives have mm -hmm. success. I, I consider it part, like as great as the signings that I've made, that I'm putting great people out in the world to work. But I forget sometimes that the people who are working for me in other positions are trying to make their mark too. So the assistant thing, it's hard, you know, you don't want to like, be not, you know, sometimes we sit in A&R meetings, I let all my assistants come into A&R meetings. And if an assistant mentions something in that meeting that they didn't say to their boss first, I'm like, oh, that's so not gonna be good. Because they have somebody they work for. Even interns, same thing. Don't come to me before. Go through the, go through the system. Yeah. And that's the other Another thing, you point. don't always have to go to the boss. When you're looking for a job, just, you know, Make friends with other, not just the assistants, the manager, the people who are coming up. Mid they have more time, mid level. They have more time to invest in you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could decide whether you get the job, but like make friends first. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's actually based on a relationship and that they actually have a reason to have confidence. <laughs> You've yeah. sold your confidence yeah. Yeah. story to them. Yeah. And your confidence. Yeah. 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 No lack of confidence. No. Yeah. I would no. add also, um, I think, I hope Jody remembers this, but one thing that I thought worked really well for me was finding a gap or finding something that's missing Ooh, and then bringing value. So Absolutely. when I was there, I wasn't tasked to start a scouting program, but I said, hey, this is Marty Bandier's company. I went to the Bandier program. I have a bunch of friends who have their ear to the street. They're going to shows all the time and they could be helping this company for the guy and everyone who started our program. So I got with another student and I built a website and I had a bunch of students come and actually a bunch of the artists, this was two years ago, that we put on that site. One of them was Kids These Days with Vic Mensa. Love him. Jake Bug, Birdie, mm -hmm. Capital Cities, like a bunch mm -hmm. of people. So do you guys still use that? We do sometimes, yeah. But we're trying to figure out this intern thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. this is more scouting. We can talk about it. <laughs> and then yeah. also at my job now, I mean, I'm an assistant, but I like looked at the landscape. I said, okay, here are all these people who have roles. What's my role? Where can I add value? Well, we have a roster of writers and producers, and no one's checking in on them. No one's setting them up with sessions, and I like doing that. So I said, hey, pick me. I can help do this, and I can. I like doing A and R. I like going into the studio. So. That's, I've created a position for myself and I get to be there in a few months. No, you actually have a very full-time intensive job with an intensive boss who is an intensive schedule. Very but intensive. But you added that to your plate. And I also put my foot down and I said, hey, this has been an amazing opportunity, but I have ambitions to be right. elsewhere. And he was really responsive. Okay. And so, so did you actually get some of the administrative load reduced so that you could do more of the writers and stuff like that? No, I just made the Oh, time. you just added another two hours to your day. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, but there it is. Yeah. And that's how you've grown your job title mm -hmm. and your job description. Nobody, you know, if, if we're, we've talked about a lot of strategies, but at the end of the day, you'd best be a workaholic if you're really serious about this business. You know, there was no real, it's great to have your, your, your job description expanded, but don't think that that necessarily means that you still don't have to go back and make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. So, you know, yeah. what, what Olivia said, the thing about creating an opportunity mm -hmm. and then going into your boss, even if it means at the end of the day, don't think that we don't notice those people at the end of the day that are still there. Mm -hmm. Like, then make that time. Because I know that Ron Breitman leaves at 6.30. He's yeah. done. Mm -hmm. so, does it, so you have more time then to, I'm serious, yeah. to, to create that for yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, the same thing when I started, I was at Chapel Music, and I was in the tape room. And after everybody left, I would then start pitching songs. And I would do it, and so I didn't go and say, can I pitch songs? Am I allowed to do this? I went in to my boss and said, I, I just got placements. I, I, like, I can do this. I've done it. Mm -hmm. If you ask permission, it's easy for people to say no. Right. If you That's do true. it, but make sure that you're covering your bases. Mm -hmm. You know, Do what you want to do. And you know what? If, it, if you're that good at it and it doesn't work out there, there'll be another place for you. But do it. Use the, You're there. Take advantage of it. Is there, uh, is there a change in the company cultures in LA versus New York? Do you, do you feel like companies, when I, Jingle Punks has got this kind of silly fun atmosphere in both places as far as I can see, but do you see the culture of the New York Sony ATV offices being yeah. different yeah. the LA I, I mean, I think the thing is talent is in L.A. now. There's yeah. talents in L.A. and the mm -hmm. entertainment business is in L.A. Yeah. So I think cultures have always been different. It used to be that, you know, New York people thought that we slept in and <laughs> they were busy working and, you know, we were just like manana having really long lunches. But there's <laughs> so much more to do here. <laughs> it's true. But there's so much more to do in L.A. If, if for what I do, just because talent's here and because 
you know, there, there are television companies and film companies and production companies, and there's just, there's, and it, there's so much kind of overlapping, and, and you can't just do one thing anymore. So I do, and I think that New York has just become a little more business centric. There's not as much. Like admin kind of business centric? Or? I think, yeah, business yeah. affairs. Finance, finance, stuff like that, finance. Yeah. It's a lot more yeah. in New York for my company, for a lot of the record companies. Yeah. Although, you know, there's still rec those record companies based in New York, but there's just not as much to do creatively. Kelly, uh, between, um, well, you certainly. Well, for us, it's a little different because our office in New York is it's more of a regional office, yeah. whereas here it's the AG Live headquarters. headquarters. Yeah. Um, the one thing that, I mean, it's it's not really related to the business, but dress code, like what people oh, wear. Yeah. <laughs> I was shocked when I moved to LA to see how many people like came in with rock and flip flops yeah. and like yeah. the summer wear. I just, <laughs> living in New York for a while, it just, I still haven't like, I, I just can't bring myself to do that. It just doesn't feel right to me. But that, that was one of the notice I did, uh, one of the things I noticed that was different. Um, within our company, there's not really a big cultural difference. They're working on similar things that we're working on, just, you know, the New York office handles, uh, there's a different touring division there that they handle Justin Bieber and Carrie Underwood and different pop acts. We handle different things, but there, there's not a huge difference in that respect, I don't think. Um, and what about Nashville in contrast between, we'll say, Sony ATV's office or something like that? Um, well, our admin's out of Nashville, so there's that. Oh, but then right. creatively, right. you know, the thing about Nashville it's is, like I mean, it's thri It's so amazing, and there's so much of appreciation. A lot of writers it. there. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing, but very different. Writers in Nashville treat their job as a nine to five. Does SB have a remote office in New York? Mm, no, we don't. But we just actually signed an artist in Nashville, and it's like been a very interesting experiment because they're like, we do things the Nashville way. And we don't know what that is. <laughs> so, learning. Would you think about having a satellite office at some point? And if so, where would you know? I don't know. Uh, yeah, they're thinking about London and New York. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you have actually quit a job and taken an internship a year and a half out of college, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, would, would you do it again? Oh, yeah, for right. sure. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I ended up where, and I mean, I'm still heading in a direction, but I'm on the path that I wanted to be in, and that was the only way to get it done. So I made the decision of what I wanted to do and did what I needed to do to do it. You know, it, uh, before we started tonight, Jody was pointing out that there are beginning to be some legal rumblings about internships, and there was a uh, hoopla with Warner Music Group recently where a young man sued because he thought he he actually thought he brought value that wasn't compensated and don't slave, be that guy slave, huh? don't be that guy yeah. oh definitely don't be that guy uh, it, it, especially with the Bandier program requiring three internships before you graduate we'd really be in trouble but uh, having said that Colleges are going to be nervous about this. Companies are going to be nervous about this. Is there some middle ground, some sort of like, you know, car fare compensation, internship compensation package? I, I think Is that, that right? um, yeah, I mean, for us, for Sony, and I think Universal is taking the same position, you're going to have to get paid something. Some, I mean, I think for us, I think it's going to force the companies to get more specific and have a pro, an internship program. That's and I, not but, a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's not a bad thing because sometimes you just, you know, give someone an internship because, you know, they want the opportunity and you figure, you know, it's a great opportunity. The thing that worries me, though, is because I now have my, in, what, I'm, what I thought would be a good program for interns and Olivia, it started as this kind of scouting thing. And my fear is that, you know, the way you guys discover music is, you know, you're surfing the net, you find stuff. I don't have time while during the day, nor does anyone who worked for me, to just do that all day long. And I do think because that's such a big way to discover music, mm -hmm. that it's an interesting internship program. Yeah. I mean, where like they just are on the computer all day and they bring in stuff or, or they research stuff for us. What's happening with such and such band? Is there, get, are they getting any traction? And I like that idea, but now I feel like 
Maybe one of your people want to put together the internship. Maybe that's a good internship. Yeah. Put together, together the internship. Because <laughs> <program. laughs> um, it just means yeah. that it takes time out of somebody's day to figure this out. But we will. It, well, I think and yes, I think that eventually, but what happens with getting compensated is it has to go through finance and you have to create a budget for it. But I think that'll happen ultimately, better than getting sued. I mean, I, I think that it's a, you know, a, people love seeing live shows. I think that, I think in terms of the um, record business, it's going to be more subscription based and digital. I don't think anybody cares about having physical product. But I think it's such a tremendous time because kind of anybody can make things happen. You could be a friend of a band and know more than a, a manager who has lots of experience in how to break your friend's band. I just think, I don't, I don't know that there'll be as many opportunities in big companies, big record companies, but I do think there's gonna be tremendous opportunity to do it yourself and get it to the point I mean, I think, like, if I were going to do something now, I would have started some kind of, if I could do it all over again, if, if I was starting now, I would start some kind of 360 company where it was management, production, record company, and it was all in-house. Similar to what Scooter's doing, but real synergies. Because I, I do think that that's where it's going. I do. I think that people don't want to sign to major labels. They don't want to give up all their rights to a big company who doesn't really provide services. You know, it more, it's more of a grab. You know, you get a piece of touring, but you're not doing anything for touring, you know? So I don't know if that's a... Olivia, um, you do have a certain amount of entrepreneurship in your DNA. Um, do you see yourself eventually just being an entrepreneur, perhaps working for your own company? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think Asher says this a lot, there are no rules in this game right now. Um, so anything is possible and that's really exciting. Um, I definitely think for me, you know, it's important to be where I am now and to learn what's going on and be able to step back and see all the different players and meet as many people as possible and then figure it out from there. And it, would you stay in LA to launch something like that? I have no idea. Yeah. Not necessarily. Maybe London. And I guess that's really what we're talking about is that you, you know whatever it is whether you want to work for a corporate giant or a small company or yourself you do have to figure it out you do have to have that confidence. Yeah. You do have to be able to communicate that to the smallest person lowest on the totem pole and the top person that actually makes the final yeah. hiring decision. Do you have anything to say about resumes? Or does it offend yeah. you when somebody, yeah. I just interviewed two people today for the first time, which was a crazy experience. If mm -hmm. your resume is not organized, fix that. Yeah. Because that is like, I just looked at this person on paper and it was like, 2010 to 2013 and 2009 to 2012 and like 2008 to present and it was all not chronological the formatting was wrong <laughs> it wasn't one of mine but. it wasn't one page <laughs> if it's more than one page i probably won't read it one page yeah or, or anything that's just a red Hold flag yourself. like that <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to cook them down to one page for years. Yeah, one page. <laughs> I was going to say, what about cover letters? Well, you know what? I do want to, we got time for a couple of questions, but use the mic over here. Or project. Uh, I was going to say, what about cover letters? Like, what, if, what is something in cover letters that really stands out to you guys that makes a good candidate? That you know what you're, uh, what you're applying for, that you know the company, that you throw in some little, like, extra thing that you know what you're, what you're inquiring That's about and what you're interested yeah. in so that you've, even if you don't know a ton about the position or the company, oh, you know, I know, I see you guys are involved with this that's going on right now. Yeah. Um, and cover letters, it just depends the route that you're getting into the company, whether it's necessary or not. It can never hurt, though. Um, but it shows that that extra little bit that you've actually taken the effort, that this is what you're interested in, this is why. When I was looking for a job, I wrote so many like tailored cover letters for each specific
person that I was sending it to because I wanted to give them a representation of something that was directly related to what they were doing. So I think having just a cookie cutter cover letter, just it doesn't stand out. But if you make it specific to who you're sending it to, that helps a lot. It's so true. And you know, I, I keep thinking about things that are turnoffs. Here's the other thing. You guys have no excuses not to know who you're reaching out to. Oh. You have the internet. When people come into my office and say, so tell me how you got started in your career. I'm like, you came into my office, you don't know who I am? Like, are you kidding me? Like, it's that thing, and you're right. Like, when you're writing notes, dear Jody, you know what? Um, I've read this article that you were quoted in, and it'll get my, it'll get my attention. I'm not, I, believe me, I don't need, like, you know, it's playing to my ego. But it, it'll be like, oh, you've done the work. You know, I really want to be a music public, whatever it is. You know, and I see what Sony ATV, D, Sony ATV has done here. It makes you kind of go, oh, okay, that person savvy. It shows that you're interested yeah. without you just saying, I'm interested. Right. And I think there's also a fine line between tailoring your cover letter, knowing who you're talking to, and being like annoying and creepy. Right. So don't do that. Right. Creepy. And Facebook. like, don't, don't, don't go on Facebook. Up. Don't you be like, don't go on yeah. Facebook. Don't contact me on <laughs> Facebook. Oh, kidding okay. me? Don't. Please don't contact oh, me no, on I've Facebook. I've gotten that. Like, really? All the time. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, and by the way, I won't even remember by the next day that I was supposed to reply. <laughs> Yell. Uh, so you talked about the internet and having people kind of maybe interns looking around the internet, mm -hmm. and I'm sure Scooter Run, I don't know if they do the same thing. But what catches, besides having that innate kind of sense of taste, what catches your attention of things on the internet? kind of random, at least for me. It's like if you hear something and it's good, you kind of just know it's good. But then don't you look how many views, where, how many friends, yeah. how many you know, followers, how many, but that's what every record company is looking at. No, you don't, it's not like they have to do the work themselves anymore. It's all right there, yeah. all right there. People come into my office and say, you know, I, I want to be an artist. Be an artist, develop a fan base. But if you, you know, you can't get a deal anymore just because you have a great demo. You know, like, even if you do, you're gonna sit at that label until that label decides that you have a hit single. Yeah, you probably don't even wanna get a deal you at don't. this point. <laughs> yeah, you don't. Do it, mm -hmm. figure out how to do it yourself. Right. Some of the self-released self artists have actually you know, done better in terms they of what it. they, they built it in, in terms of what they held on to because they built it. Absolutely. Instead of you have more value. Kind of? mm -hmm. self not just self-publishing it's building your own fan base you know whether it's touring or whether it's putting your stuff up on YouTube making yourself interesting to a fan base growing it one by one if you're from Philadelphia and you are an artist how do you not have fans in Philadelphia who are following you you know, are you playing shows? Like you guys would look to see if they're playing shows. Yeah, for us it's all about, if we're looking at somebody that's developing, it's all about seeing them live. You know, can, in the club, in a smaller venue, do we see, when we're trying to look at people that maybe we want to get involved with for the long term, can we see them taking that to the next level and going into an arena and being able to captivate the audience? They may have great music, but it's also about if they're a performer and going to be able to take it to that next step. Or if you're a small artist and you make a personal connection with someone who tells you they're your fan by responding to them on YouTube or Facebook or whatever it is, that person is going to stick with you because you've now said, like, you know hey, I see that you're supporting me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our panelists have uh, other obligations this evening, so we're, we're going to let them go. But I'd like to ask you if you have any final thoughts for the students and alums. I just think that there's so much opportunity. It might not be in the traditional sense of getting a job in a company. I just think there's a lot of opportunity. And I would agree. I think that's one of the things that uh, opened my eyes a bit because when I was in college, I didn't realize the number of jobs that you could do and be involved in music. You can go on the road as a production assistant and, and work your way up that way. You can go work at a venue. There's just so, 
so many things. You just have to figure out what you're interested in or try a few things and figure it out that way. But there really are so many ways for you to find your niche and what, what you want to do and be involved in this business. Oh, and one other thing, stick with the job that you have until you have another job. Because another thing about a resume. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, like, I'm like Kelly. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> but you weren't in the music business. No, it was different. You weren't in yeah. the music business. The thing is, like, when I look at a resume, not internships, if I look at jobs that they've had and they've jumped around, I'm like, oh, yeah. not good. Yeah. But, you know, just use your position, use wherever you are to get to the next step. Not obviously, and make sure you get your job done. But having, having a situation in the music business, it's better being in it than being out of it. And I would say mind over matter. I truly believe that. When I was like decided what I wanted to do and where I wanted to work, I put my mind to it, and nothing was going to stop me from doing that. And I strongly believe you can manifest what you really want. Make it happen. Yeah. Make it happen, you guys. Thank you, Kelly, Jody. Olivia.